Good morning. Well, this may be uh, your first APDA conference. Maybe you've been to all of them. Uh, but no matter how many times you've joined us, we hope you walk away with uh, some new knowledge and most importantly, an optimistic outlook to your future. And you may wonder, some new folks here, why I'm here. And I'll just tell you quickly that my father, Ken, I was diagnosed when he was 79, 80. Uh, and uh, we lived and helped him with his diagnosis in Parkinson's for about 10 years. He died three years ago at age 90. <clears throat> and my mom is here, Marilyn. She was his caregiver uh, for that entire time. And uh, as you all know, that's a tough gig. Uh, but she did it, and he lived uh, much longer probably than he would have without her care. So it's important. There you go. A hand for, for my mom. And so I, I learned how important it is to be able to get help and get information and learn. And it's a, it's a, it's a process. And so I'm happy to be here today to sort of help spread the word. And uh, I understand almost everything that folks are going through, although everybody has an individual case. And so I'm happy to be here and share that. So, so let's do a little housekeeping. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to bring your attention to the program book that hopefully everybody received when you arrived. And if you look at the inside cover of the front, there is a map on that uh, page. It shows uh, all the rooms here in this beautiful church. And that uh, has all the breakout rooms as well as the location for restrooms, which you may need. And then if you have any questions, you can stop by one of the, all the, those wonderful volunteers who are outside and here, and we have uh, a way to help sort of point you in the right direction if you get lost or have any questions. Uh, the volunteers, by the way, are the folks in those uh, bright green shirts, and so they're easy to spot out there. And then your program book also has today's agenda in there, and then there are the speaker profiles of all the folks who will be talking today. <clears throat> now, for those of you who registered for a contact hours, you have to check in with DMAC rep. That's at the HOPE entrance. You can check out with them also at the end of the day to receive uh, your certificate, and this is very important to receive credits uh, for that. And now if you did not already check in, please uh, return to the main entrance and you can check in now uh, if you'd like. Now to make sure you get the most out of today's event, uh, take time to meet, of course, all the other individuals that are here. As you come in today, you stop by, a, the, there was a name badge table out there and at that table you picked up the colored stickers. I think everybody has those on their badges and we'd love for you to use those, and that way you can make connections with folks and know what questions to ask, kind of know uh, what they're here for, and that's really what today's all about. Uh, here at Iowa, we are dedicated to helping you live with Parkinson's disease, and you can live your life to the fullest. Uh, we plan to grow the conference every year and always bring in the most up-to-date speakers and the topics to help all of you. And that is why we're thrilled with today's lineup and how far some of today's presenters have traveled to share all of their knowledge and their expertise with you. Now, before we get to our program, let's get started to take a moment and we will reflect on why. Why are we here today? Who is your why? Why are you here today? Of course, we all have different reasons, but we do have the same reason too. Parkinson's disease has touched each and every person in this building, and we're glad that you're here today as we all try to navigate the best way to live life to its fullest with Parkinson's disease. So let's get started with our program. I'm gonna switch chairs here, hang on. Hello everyone. So grateful you're all here. I'm Susan Callison, and I am helping coordinate today's event. And you all should have gotten a program. If you have two for your couple and you don't need two 
I would welcome the extra one. Of course, you can keep it if you both want one, but we just ran out. So how about that? We have become, again, record numbers, largest in the nation. So if you have an extra one, drop it back at the entry so that folks are just coming in now because this is your guidebook for the day. So thanks so much for sharing. All right, we're going to switch gears. <clears throat> And I'm going to sit down for a while, so we have some special guests here today. Uh, we'd like to introduce our keynote speakers. Uh, this is Kay Arvidson and Lyle Gibson. Uh, both Kay and Lyle have earned MBAs, and they are retired now from their uh, successful careers. And along their journey, as you might guess, they were both diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And uh, like everybody that is diagnosed, they needed to learn some new tips and some tools to live their best life. And today, we get to hear their inspirational stories, so we thank you for coming. So please, if you will, help me welcome uh, to hear about uh, Kay's Parkinson's disease journey and Lyle's life in motion. Let's have a nice round of applause for them. So let's get started, and uh, ladies first. Uh, Kay, let's talk about uh, uh, your diagnosis. How did this happen and when did it happen? When I was first learned that there was a problem with my brain, I thought that my breast cancer had advanced because it goes to the brain and it goes to the bone. And so I was uh, totally unprepared for a Parkinson's diagnosis. I was relieved, at least temporarily, and uh, I didn't understand. I remember the words progressive, degenerative, movement disorder, and no cure, but that's about all I remember from my first appointment. I went to the library and I got some books on Parkinson's disease and I read up on it and I got immediately deeply depressed. And I wanted to approach my disease with a positive attitude, but it took me a long time to get there. Actually, it took me years to get there. Uh, and I don't think that it's uncommon that your first reaction is one of negative. But uh, I turned that around in time and I feel very positive about my illness now. And when were you diagnosed? I was diagnosed in 2017. So it's been seven years. Right. And that's a very similar story. And Lyle, let's talk about your diagnosis. Okay. I'm going to apologize. I've got lots of notes, so I'm going to try not to read too much. But I don't rely on my memory too much anymore. So, Well, I was officially diagnosed 11 years ago at age 60. Um, but I began noticing some issues two years before that. Uh, and I'd kind of like to change subjects just for a second here and kind of set, set up what I'm going to be talking about later on. But um, I don't want this to sound like I'm bragging or anything. I just want to kind of fill you in w what I used to do. I was a two-time All-State baseball player in high school here in Iowa. That's been a long time ago, 70 and 71. I played four years of college baseball. I was a tennis professional for about seven or eight years. I, I played the number one player in the world in doubles. And I also played a guy by the name of Bill Cosby, <laughs> which it was a lot more fun back then when I played him, of course, as opposed to now. But, um, and then I became a, <clears throat> a runner. I ran over 100,000 miles. Um, I ran 16 marathons. I, ran, I qualified for the Boston Marathon seven times and ran it twice. Uh, I was a high school baseball coach for 22 years, uh, high school tennis coach for 10 years, and I won two national titles in the 50 and over baseball championships in Las Vegas. So I was a national champion in baseball, came full circle with that. And Parkinson's stopped me from playing the last few years of 50 and over baseball, because I, like I said, I started feeling some things in, when I was 58. Um, initially, I was told I had dystonia in my left foot. There was no, well, I should say the doctor did mention Parkinson's once. He said dystonia can be a precursor to Parkinson's, but he didn't think, you know, I was in such good shape that he didn't seem to care much. We'll, we'll kind of follow things and see how it goes. But um, I was put on a couple of different medications and uh, I gradually developed some other problems. I had some slight dizziness, balance problems, that type of th stuff. And eventually they took away one of my medications. 
and things got worse. Um, I was literally bouncing off the walls when I was walking down hallways, uh, having severe dizziness, memory problems, leg pain, just about everything you could imagine. And I started reading as much as I could about the various conditions I was having. And Parkinson's kept popping up on, the, on my computer screen. And I'm, I'm sure everybody's seen this, but no matter what website you go to, you'll see the 10 symptoms of Parkinson's. And I kept going down that list and I, I had seven solid of the 10, so I knew something wasn't right. But anyway, I called the nurse, called my nurse. Within a couple of days, I was seeing a doctor, seeing my neurologist, and he told me then that he was pretty certain I had Parkinson's at that time. And I'm sure he probably was thinking of that a month or two ahead of time, but that's kind of where we're at, so. And I'm sure that's probably a familiar story <clears throat> in yeah. some form for folks here. Um, so once you find out, obviously you've got to figure out, well, what's next? Yeah. So, um, Kay, let's talk about, you mentioned you went to the library and you did some research, but how did you sort of take charge of what you were going to do? Well, I retired earlier than I had expected. I retired the next year after my diagnosis. I was 65 years old and I had wanted to stay and work longer. I wanted to get 8% more in my social security check, <clears throat> but um, I knew I needed to focus on my health. So I, uh, I did retire, and I was given a gift. I have it on right now, it's this bracelet. And it has a quote that says, Still I Rise, by Maya Angelou. That's who had this quote, and it became my PD mantra. I thought, well, if I have a good day, still I rise. If I have a bad day because Parkinson's is cyclical, still I rise. If another symptom comes along, still I rise. Whatever happens, I just keep thinking, still, I rise. And that's how I took the charge. And let's uh, see what Lyle has to say about taking well, charge. Well, I didn't really take charge at first. I, I was in pretty severe depression, to be honest. You know, I was an athlete. That's what I was kind of known for, I guess. And all of a sudden, I realized I can't do the things I used to do. So um, I was, it was kind of an inner arrogance, I guess. You know, I, I'm thinking I'm not the person I used to be, and people are going to be seeing that. And oh, I was almost embarrassed at times, but I tell you what, it, it took my wife to get me out of my funk, uh, my wife Janice. And it was kind of simple but profound. She said, you know, you've ran 16, and you've trained and ran 16 marathons in your day, and you got through all of that. You can get through this. And I mean, simple, but it kind of struck a, a note there and it got me, got me going. And uh, so I started to study and learn all I could about Parkinson's. I was on the computer constantly. And what I was noticing is, and it was kind of new at the time, that the studies were showing that exercise tended to have a positive effect on Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. um, they, it was showing that it was slowing the progression down and I thought, well, okay. This, this gives me something to really think about. So by trial and error, I developed an exercise program that I could handle. I had to change everything around and, you know, to my limitations now that I had. And um, what I did, I developed a program that had cardio in it for my heart and um, light weights, exercise bands for strength. Um, yoga, I did yoga every day for balance and flexibility. And I also included face, voice, and hand exercises. And, and I've kind of stuck with that for 11 years now. So I have to change it every so often, but it's pretty much the same, same thing day to day, so. And that's encouraging, an exercise I know for my father and for folks out here may know, it is really a deal. Yes, uh, and I think we're gonna hear more about that here yeah, soon. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, Kay, you've had the diagnosis, you took charge, and you kind of pointed this out earlier. How, how, how did you live well as this <coughs> progressed? Well, I had deep brain stimulation surgery three years ago, and that was a turning point for me. That really, really made a difference in my life. It gave me back my life. 
I found the positive outlook that I was seeking about my illness, and I stopped shaking, I had better movement, and I found a quote at the same time that really guided me in these recent years, and that is that the purpose of life is to find your gift, and the meaning of life is to give it away. So I decided I would give my gift to Parkinson's disease. I joined the board of the American Parkinson's Disease Association, the Iowa chapter. I resurrected with board members and other staff the Live It magazine that had been dormant for two and a half years during COVID, and that goes out to a third of the people who have Parkinson's in the state. I joined an organization called twitchywomen.com. I'm a mentor for that group. I joined the Michael J. Fox Buddy Network, and I speak to support groups. I'm a Medtronic ambassador. Medtronic is the equipment that's in my brain that changed my life. Uh, I'm an ambassador for that program. I speak on their conferences, and I coach other people who are thinking about DBS surgery. And I started to participate in research. I've done research at Iowa State University, and I've done research with the Cleveland Clinic on different ways that this brain stimulator can be programmed for other symptoms besides twitching and shaking. So it's, uh, it's a fascinating process, wow. and that's how I live well. And let me ask you the same thing. You mentioned it a little bit, uh, sort of the changes you've had to make and how you're living well. Well, I, one thing, um, I've got the best care partner I think I could ever have in the world. I've been married 50, 50 and a half years now to my wife, Janice, and she's a terrific care partner. And I've got great friends to, that I socialize with and we do a lot of things together. So that, that really helps. Um, the exercise I do, for sure. I mean, I have to have that, so there's no question on that one. But man, you know, can't live by exercise alone. So I had to find some new things and some old things to do to, to fill my time and make me feel like I'm doing something worthwhile. So um, when my wife was gone, I would get on the computer and I started taking guitar lessons from... Now, I'm never going to be a member of the Eagles or IO <laughs> Speedwagon. But I did find out with, by playing three or four chords, you can sing along to just about 50% of the old rock songs. So that was kind of neat. So. Um, oh, and speaking of singing, my wife, who happens to be the music director, the choir director, the organist, pianist for our church, um, I wanted to learn how to sing a little better. And I was hoping to be able to sing a duet with her in church sometime. So I took some voice lessons the same way as I did the, the other online. And I harassed her enough that she let me sing with her a couple times. And at our church, it's nothing quite like this, but the baby grand piano is up in the left-hand corner all the way to the front of the stage. So it'd be like over there facing the stage. So all the people are up to the side or behind and I set my chair, when, when we sang the duet, I sang, set my chair right next to her, and she's right here beside me. I had my microphone, and she played the piano. So everybody was either hidden from me over here, or I had my back to them, so it was kind of like being alone. So I sang, and it didn't go too bad. But then I wanted to go a little farther. I thought, I want to sing a solo, you know, kind of a whatever, bucket list type thing, I guess. But So I sang, a, she let me sing a solo, and... That was the first solo I ever sang, and it'll be the last. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was scarier than being up here doing this, so I can tell you. Oh, and then uh, I think everybody knows a little bit about Bob Ross, oh, yeah. the oh, painter. happy little painter. Years ago when I was watching it on TV, I just got hooked to him, and I went out and bought all those supplies and canvases, and I was just having a great time painting little landscapes and happy trees and everything, and... I decided to get back into that again, so I did a lot of painting, and it's kind of neat, though. My mother, who passed away, she was 98, she passed away last year, but um, she used to love my paintings, and she had them hanging all around her house on the walls, and she had an annual garage sale. She would take about three of my paintings out and sell them, and swear to gosh, I sold those things for three Dollars. <laughs> she would get two or three dollars out of them, and I was a starving artist. I mean, I was a true starving artist, but um, what else? Oh, 
I was writing my first book at the time about my life experiences in sports. And I was getting near the end of writing the book when I was diagnosed with Parkinson's. And I thought, well, I need to write a, an extra chapter to talk about that a little bit. So that kind of kicked things off. I, w I had a lot of newspaper interviews and um, I had a TV interview, which was pretty scary. A lot of, a lot of radio interviews. And anyway, for some reason, people, somebody saw it and made, gave me a call, and it, it just kind of blossomed into, I got calls from service clubs, churches, hospitals, Parkinson's support groups, asking me if I would come and talk to them a little bit. And I thought, well, I'll give that a shot. Yeah, and it was really fun. I've talked to over 100 different groups now, and really it's uh, allowed me to become an advocate for Parkinson's and and exercise, so that's my story, I guess. That's very encouraging, I would say. A lot of book signings. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, well, we touched on it, let's expand on this. Uh, I know my dad uh, was, when he was diagnosed, exercise was the one big tool they said can help uh, extend uh, your life, and yeah. uh, you both have dealt with that. So let's talk about what exercise has meant for you. When I ca first came to this conference, uh, I, I heard Christine Meldrin speak about exercise, and I learned about the science behind exercise. I learned that you can reduce your symptoms by as much as 35% by doing aerobic exercise, and that you can also reduce the progression of your disease through exercise. And that was all I needed to, do, to know to be motivated to exercise. That made sense to me. I didn't exercise to lose weight. I didn't exercise to look better, but I would exercise to, to delay and to fight this disease that was trying to rob me of the quality of my life. So that was very important for me. And I used to say, I still do, the bane of my existence is now my salvation. <laughs> That's my perspective on exercise. Uh, Chris has been my coach for almost three years. Her, she wrote a book on Parkinson's, How to Reduce Symptoms Through Exercise. You can find out about it at parkinsonsbook.com. And she has what she calls a PD exercise cocktail. My cocktail has five parts. The first part is aerobic exercise because that turns your brain on. The next part is Parkinson's specific exercise, which is when you do multitasking, you, you move your hands like this or you're doing something with your body and you're doing something else with your mind like counting forwards or backwards by threes or fives, or sevens even, or saying all things that start with the letter S, saying different words that start with a different letter of the alphabet. Just something so your brain is engaged and your body is engaged, but they're doing different things. And then the next part of it is strength training. The next part of the cocktail is balance work. And the last part is doing something that you love. And I love to grow flowers. I grow dahlias. So gardening is the thing that I do that I love. So. Um, Chris lets you name your, your Parkinson's cocktail. I, I like screwdrivers, so I name my Parkinson's cocktail, Screw You Parkinson's. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it, it works for me, and I hope that uh, you can find a, an exercise cocktail that works for you. Sounds very tasty. Wow. <laughs> uh, and speaking of exercise, certainly that was almost your whole life, right? So exactly. probably not a different, yeah, maybe well, different routine. But with the exception of being with my wife and family and my friends and doing all that kind of stuff, it's probably right at the top. I mean, every morning, it's usually the first thing I do. Um, in fact, this morning, whenever I go out somewhere and I have to stay in a motel, I never have time to do my full, my full exercise program usually takes about 90 minutes, but I did 30 minutes, let's see, 32 minutes on my exercise bike this morning. This is what I did. I, so I sat there in the dark, my wife was asleep and I would be doing this for 32 minutes and then I have my band and I'm stretching. So that's, my, that's what I do when I'm stuck for time. I, I still find a way to do it, but uh, one thing I've picked up on now is p pickleball. I, I think everybody's probably pretty much familiar with it. It's, you hear it all the time. And I just love to play, I, my only fear is to, maybe fall is falling and I, I got to be real careful. So I have to kind of slide all over the place. But being an, an old tennis pro, 
I still have the, I, the angles I can hit and some of the strategy that the other guys don't know. So we have a group of eight players that play, four couples, my wife included, and we're all over 70 with, with the age of the young guy. He's 68, but we play twice a week for two hours and um, sometimes three times a week. And Janice just understands how important it is to me, so she never says a word about it. She just lets me go ahead and do my thing in the morning, and then we get started after I'm done, usually. And um, my, if I have any quote that I live by, it would be, motion is the magic potion. So. Oh, I like that. Got to have the exercise. But no, no stiff drinks for you? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> At least not yet. All right. Um, as we kind of wrap this up, let's talk about sort of the bigger picture uh, life lessons that you've learned or would like to share with folks. Well, one of them is what I call just-in-time inventory. I don't want to know about what could be. I want to know about what is <coughs> and the symptoms that I'm having now, not what might happen in the future. And that's one of the things I really like about APDA because they have a wealth of information on whatever happens to be the symptom that is newest or most prevalent in your life. So I can always go to APDA and find out about something when it happens. I just don't want to know about what might be. I want to know about what is. So that's one of the things that I, I have. I have a few more, but maybe we can go back and forth on that one. Okay. You got one, Lyle? Well, the one thing I've learned is I'm, I'm definitely not alone in this. I mean, um, I've got my family, I've got my friends, uh, best care partner in the world, like I said. Um, I've noticed my friends have grown more as I have too. They've learned more about the disease and, and you know, I think they know, they're more empathetic towards me and I think that's kind of nice. And also I've met so many different people just like at conferences and things like that. I, I, I do a lot of back and forth with people on the phone, um, texting, emailing, we go back and forth. And the one thing about that is after I get done talking with somebody with Parkinson's, I, I can almost always tell you I feel better and I think usually they do too because we have something in common and we can go back and forth about those things that we have in common or we don't have in common and try to make things better that way. So that's my... Well, another thing I've learned is that I have way more power in my life than I ever realized. And that has helped me as I've aged to recognize that power and to utilize it. I have the power to set my attitude and I have the power to control my exercise. And I feel that with those things, I have the power to control my destiny. Well, and I've learned that you can't beat a great medical team if you have Parkinson's. And I have one of those, so. University of Iowa. Very good. Um, one of the things that I become aware of is that by 2030, the baby boomer generation, the last ones, will reach the age of 65, which means there will be more people in our population over the age of 65 than under the age of 65, which is a prime time for Parkinson's disease diagnosis. So I think we have a PD tsunami coming. Uh, they're, we're expected to double the number of people with Parkinson's within the next 10 years. So now is the time for us to, to participate in research. Now is the time for us to donate if we can, because now is the time to really have an effect on the future of Parkinson's disease. Well, I've learned that I need to not only work my body, but my mind and my spirit too. So um, if I'm gonna live life to the fullest, I read a lot, I try to stay up on, you know, local, regional, world news. Um, I do online trivia tests, IQ tests, which we won't go into that. I think, I think it's about, above 100, but I can't remember exactly. And also I read daily devotions, so. I've learned that you, it's okay to ask for help. I have a wonderful care team, my doctors, physical therapists, my friends, and it's okay to ask for help, and it's okay to receive help. That was a stumbling block for me for quite some time. But now, 
I, I mean, even strangers, sometimes I get out of my car and I'm at the grocery store and someone says, could you use a cart to help you walk? And I don't know who that is, but they just help me out a little bit and it's okay. It's okay to ask for help, it's okay to receive help. And um, people want to help. Well, Parkinson's obviously isn't funny, but I think humor can help with the spirit at times, um, make things a little better. I know one thing I've done with my wife before, you know, I, I do face exercises, you know, where I, and all these sorts of things. And so let's say Janice and I are having maybe just a little spat or something. And if I hear her coming down the hallway, I can go, <laughs> Parkinson's, sorry, I'm doing my exercises. So. Good excuse. Yeah, so anyway. Um, everybody knows somebody with PD. I have discovered that everybody does. It, maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a relative, but everybody I've talked to knows somebody with PD and everybody is different. Every combination of symptoms is different in everyone. So that's one of the things I've learned to own my Parkinson's. I call it my Parkinson's instead of just Parkinson's disease because it's part of who I am. It's not all of who I am. It's not all of what I do. But it's a major part of my life, and I own it now. Well, I would say I've learned don't be afraid to tell your doctor when something changes. He'll have something that he can help you with or find somebody that can help you. I know when I first got Parkinson's, I, was, I think I almost would go in there and try to fake the doctor out and show him how good I'm doing. And that's not the way to do it. If something's wrong, let him know. I use that medical team. So, and my final one, and then you can go on if you have 14 more. But um, <laughs> motion is the magic potion. Keep that in mind. So, and just to sum mine up, I it took me a long time to be able to remember with joy what I once could do. I used to think, why is it so hard to do anything? Why is everything so difficult? And I, weren't, I learned to change my mindset and remember with joy what I once could do and not make it a negative in my life. Really strive to keep things positive. That's good. All right. Well, that was inspirational, I would say, Kay. And uh, I'll thank you so much. Uh, what would you think? Thank you. Thank you. We'll stay right here for a couple seconds while we uh, get on with the program. Um, so let's do a little show of hands. Uh, how many of you here today have done or even thought about exercise for Parkinson's disease? So that's a good, almost everybody. Um, so we're going to invite uh, Dr. Elizabeth uh, Stegemaller to present on exactly why we all need to move. And uh, I think right here, here we go. So stay where you are. I'm gonna uh, turn it over to you. <laughs> 